Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kalaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times Live Conversation Series, Times Talks. For 20 years, Times Talks has paired New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of theater, music, art, social justice, politics, film, and literature. I'm honored to introduce tonight's conversation with Pulitzer Prize-winning New York Times photojournalist and best-selling author, Lindsay Adario. Her new book, Of Love and War, to be published on October 23rd, is a stunning collection of more than 200 of her photographs documenting life in Afghanistan under the Taliban, the stark truth of sub-Saharan Africa, and the daily reality of women in the Middle East. Moderating tonight's event is New York Times foreign correspondent and three-time Pulitzer Prize finalist, Rukmini Kalamachi, one of the top experts on the Islamic State and the focus of the Times' new Caliphate podcast. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to our moderator, Rukmini Kalamachi, and our special guest, Lindsay Adario. Welcome to the Times Center. I'd like to begin with a video that I think sets some context to the type of risks that you take. in your career. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <clears throat> you were sexually assaulted on this trip. You feared very much that you were going to be raped. Um, you did not know if you would get out of this situation alive. I think a lot of people wonder, why do you do this work? I mean, I started out, the first trip I made to a conflict zone was Afghanistan when it was under the Taliban. And I think it provides some pretty good context because I was 27 years old. Uh, I couldn't get an assignment to save my life. Uh, I saved my money. And I decided to go photograph life under the Taliban and what life was like for women because I felt like that was a story that wasn't being told. So I remember the night before I left, uh, I called my mother. I was living in India. And I was like, Mom, I'm going to Afghanistan tomorrow. And she was like, have a good time, honey. <laughs> because she had no idea, of course. This is before September 11th. So no one was talking about Afghanistan. So I went, and I realized very quickly that my gender was an asset, that I could go into women's homes. I could see the way women were living. Um, because I was female, and I went into sort of the women's hospitals. This is a woman in labor. Uh, this is what the hospital looked like under the Taliban. So many of the doctors and medical professionals had left at that time because it was so dangerous, and the existence there was so bad. There were secret girls' schools. Um, this was something that was very interesting to me because I had no idea what I would face there. Um, there were so many brave Afghans who opened up their families and their homes to teach young girls school because they were not allowed to go to school under the Taliban. <clears throat> and much to my surprise, there were weddings. Uh, I had been working in a refugee camp, uh, a camp for displaced. There was a very bad drought in 2001. And I was photographing. It was the one time where I got uh, permission to actually photograph living beings under the Taliban. And my driver said, Madam, I have to go early today because there's a wedding. And I said, well, take me with you. <laughs> so he took me. And we, I remember when you walked on the streets under the Taliban, it was silent because music was illegal, TV was illegal, all forms of entertainment were illegal under the Taliban. And so we would walk down these very silent streets, and you barely saw people. And we walked into this compound, a family home, 
and descended down the stairs and the soundtrack for the Titanic was blasting. <laughs> and there were people unveiled, dancing all together, and there was a wedding. And I thought, this is incredible. These are the things that we never see. So for me, it was really a matter of going to these places that maybe we hadn't, we didn't know much about and starting to learn. And so it was curiosity more than anything. Right. Um, after September 11th, I went back. I covered the fall of Kandahar for the New York Times. It was really the first time where I was really scared because I remember we drove in. We were some of the first journalists to drive in after the Taliban fell in Kandahar. And we pulled up to the governor's mansion. And this is out the car window. This is right away. And I remember thinking, I can't get out of the car. I'm mm -hmm. too scared. They're going to eat me. <laughs> and Ruth Fremson, who I was working with, who's a photographer for the New York Times, just jumped out and started shooting. And I thought, OK, I'm going to do whatever she does. <laughs> and so that was, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about fear? Sure. So you have clearly felt it. How do, you, how do you handle it? How do you work through it? Yeah, I think a lot of people have this misconception that war photographers are fearless, and that is not at all the case. I am constantly scared. Um, I just have to figure out how to manage that fear. Where do I put it? So when I went to cover the war in Iraq, I was offered an embed position with the military, and I didn't take it because I wasn't sure I'd be able to handle my fear and, and keep up with the military. So I decided to go into the north. Uh, we crossed illegally from, Ira from Iran into northern Iraq, and we sort of waited for the humanitarian aspect of the war to happen up in the north. But immediately there was combat. There was this proxy war going on with um, Kurdish Peshmerga backed by American special forces fighting Al-Ansar. Uh, which was a terrorist group. And so right away, there were car bombs exploding next to me. And on this particular day, it was the first time we were uh, photographing people flooding out of a village. And the villagers were warning us, saying, get out of here, it's dangerous. And that's something very important that you have to take note of when you cover conflict, is you listen to the locals. And we, by the time we got our stuff together, I remember I got this feeling in the pit of my stomach and I ran back to the car and shut the door mm -hmm. and a car bomb went off and the guy who was standing next to me died. Mm -hmm. And everyone was scrambling and I was sort of paralyzed and I thought, I don't wanna do this. I don't, I, I'm not cut out to do this kind of work. And we all went to a school where they were bringing the injured. And when we went there, um, the, a taxi driver pulled up and said, is anyone here a journalist? And I sort of thought, okay, this is my way to not have to handle my emotions. And I went over and I said, yes, what do you need? I'm a journalist. And he said, I have the body of a journalist in my trunk. Can you come identify him? Okay. And I remember I just looked at him and I ran to the back of the school and just started crying. And I couldn't get out because we didn't have visas to go back into Iran. And Saddam Hussein was still in power. So I basically had to deal with staying there. Mm. I find it very interesting that you point out that it's so important to listen to your to your local partners. Yeah. Um, when I was in Mosul uh, over a year ago, uh, Eastern Mosul had just been liberated, and to the naked eye, it looked like life had come back immediately. Yeah. Um, we had been packing in our food, you know, power bars and tuna fish and um, <laughs> not very tasty stuff, and we passed one of the most famous uh, uh, restaurants in Mosul called My Fair Lady, mm -hmm. and it was bustling. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, but look, it looks fine. Let's go eat. Let's go eat. Mm -mm. And I pushed it. I insisted. We went inside. We had our meal. Um, uh, my colleagues were, were unnerved. Uh, they ended up posting somebody outside who stayed in the car, and the driver had his food brought out to him. And inside, I was like, oh, this is great. You know, it's awesome. We're having a great time. The very next day, a suicide bomber walked into that restaurant mm. and blew it to smithereens. Mm. And um, I remember just having to check myself and realize once again that, that you have to listen to your local partners. Always. And when yeah. you don't, that's when things happen. Yeah. Did you imagine that this was the work that you were going to do? No, not at all. I mean, I grew up, I was raised by hairdressers <laughs> in the 70s in Connecticut and um, a very sort of eccentric upbringing. And, uh, a lot of pool parties and <laughs> um, no, not at all. But I think it was really curiosity that start, got me started on this work and, and continued taking me all around the world. How do you make sense of the risk now that you are married to somebody that, that you love very much and that you have a small child? 
You know, last week I was in Yemen. Um, I just came back, and I think for me, I will always be driven by telling these stories, and particularly stories that haven't been told um, or are not being told enough. So <clears throat> I don't go and just take sort of gratuitous risks. I don't just go to every war zone um, that I see. For me, it's really about telling a story. For example, the war in Iraq. It was important for me as a young American woman to be there because I felt like this is going to be the war of our generation. There were mass graves being unearthed. So many civilians had been killed. Then I was able to go with the military, you know, go on patrols in the middle of the night, see them rounding up Iraqis, putting bags on their heads, zip ties on their wrists. All of this work became work that added to our knowledge, our comprehensive knowledge as a society, as Americans, um, as to what was going on in Iraq. And I think that those are always things that really drive me and that I think it's really important to be there. Do you agree that there's a misconception that war photographers are out for some sort of adrenaline rush? Absolutely. I mean, it's the number one question I get is, do you do it for the adrenaline? And I want to smack everyone <laughs> who asks me that because it's not at all about the adrenaline. It's about telling the story. It's about being there. It's about documenting history. It's about bearing witness. It's about giving a voice to all these people who don't have a voice. And I think, yes, of course, there's adrenaline in involved. I think that you know there was a point in my life in Iraq um, and Afghanistan and Darfur where I basically lived in war zones and so I was accustomed to a certain level of excitement and adrenaline but I think that was never what drove me to be there. Right. Can you talk about some of the instances where your work has truly made a difference both in both in that particular conflict and in the lives of specific individuals? I think some of the work, um, let me see if I can get there, some of the work that made a difference, um, probably some of the work on women's stories, the work on maternal mortality. Um, I know that I did a story, and I will get to the pictures uh, sort of further down. Those were some pictures that uh, Merck, which is the pharmaceutical company, um, one of their board members saw a body of work that I did from Sierra Leone, and they, that was one of the impetuses for starting Merck for Mothers. And mm -hmm. so they put aside $500 million to start Merck for Mothers based on a body of work. And so that to me is something that is, you know, really that makes me proud and really is one of the reasons why I do this work. I think that most people assume that being a woman in, in a war zone, or even being a woman in the Middle East, mm. is a disadvantage. What's your take on that? I disagree. <laughs> I think um, being a woman to me has always been a great advantage. I think that um, maybe there's a process of proving ourselves that goes on longer. Mm -hmm. For example, um, I did many years of military embeds, mm -hmm. and this is a story I did for the New York Times Magazine uh, on the Korngal Valley. I did it with Elizabeth Rubin, uh, who is a great writer for the New York Times Magazine, and she had this idea of trying to figure out why there were so many civilian casualties uh, in Afghanistan when we had some of the best technology in the world. And so we went uh, to eastern Afghanistan, and that was the place where the US military was dropping the most bombs in the country. And so we went to the public affairs officer, and we said, we'd like to go to the Korngal Valley. And he sort of looked at us up and down and said, it's not a place that's fit for women. And we said, well, why not? And he said, well, there's no place for you to sleep and no place for you to go to the bathroom. And we said, well, where do the men sleep and where do the men go to the bathroom? And he said, well, they sleep in bunkers. And we said, well, we can do that. So the next day, he talked to the commander. And they put us on Blackhawks, and they flew us out. And they started us in the Tactical Operations Center, so the command center, which for a photographer is really boring because everything is classified. And, and um, there was a battle going on on the screens. And we were able to see um, these command centers are incredible because you can see you know, drone feeds, heat sensor feeds. You could see troops in combat, everything on the screens. Mm -hmm. And so we saw this battle unfolding on the screens, and we asked to go to that place where the battle had been. And so the next morning, they flew us right into the heart of the Korngal Valley, and we stayed almost two months. Mm -hmm. And so for two months, you know, the first few weeks, we really had to prove ourselves as women and as journalists and as people that could keep up. And we did six, seven-hour-a-day patrols every single day. We were uh, under fire a lot. 
Uh, we spent long hours doing nothing, just sitting and basically waiting to get attacked or to go on patrols. Um, and at the end of it, we went on this Operation Rock Avalanche where we um, had to jump out of Blackhawks in the middle of the night, all with night vision goggles, and literally jump into the heart of the Taliban territory mm -hmm. and walk for six days with everything we owned on our backs and keep up. And this is where we slept for the first uh, three nights in this ditch. And there were, I think, 11 of us. And it was so cold. It was October. It was 7,000 feet in the mountains. And so we were literally just spooning, all of us, because we were freezing. Um, and then we got ambushed on the sixth day. And so we ended up um, getting ambushed. And this is all, you know, these are images that I don't think I could have made had we just parachuted in. You know, these are images that when a soldier dies and soldiers get, um, get shot in front of you. They're very protective. They don't necessarily want journalists around. So these are images where, you know, in this case, they're carrying the body of Sergeant Rugel, and I was crying because I had spent so much time with him. And so they, they can see that we had sort of gotten to a point um, where these pictures were okay. There was a major controversy when I was at the Associated Press um, about a photograph of, of a dying soldier that was, that was published. Did you have any pushback with these kind of images from the military? Yes, there are. Um, so the rule in the military is that if you photograph a soldier dying and his face is visible or any identifying marks, so tattoos, anything that his family can identify him, uh, you need permission from the next of kin. Right. And so in those pictures of Rugel, uh, he was in a body bag. So I, I did not need permission. But there is another series that I did um, of a soldier who was dying, and I had many, many pictures of him throughout that process. Um, he had stepped on an IED. Mm -hmm. He lost nine pints of blood. Mm -hmm. uh, he was essentially dead when they brought him into the field hospital where I was, mm -hmm. and I photographed the whole process of them, these incredible Navy doctors and mm -hmm. nurses trying to save his life, and uh, massaging his heart, <laughs> blood transfusions, mm -hmm. everything, and he passed away. Mm -hmm. And I photographed the entire thing and the prayer that they said and put a flag over his body. And the minute the whole thing finished, the public affairs officers with the Marines came right to me and said, you need permission before you can send those pictures out. And so then I got into like a, like a relationship with his father that I'm still friends with his father to this day. And this was 2009. So I had to call the father. Actually, you're not allowed to call the family. They have to call you. So I had to give my phone number to the Marines and wait for the father to call to see if I can use these pictures. And it was um, probably December 17th, 2009. So it was more than two weeks after his son had died, right before Christmas, and he called me. And he said, I don't know anything about my son's death. All I know is that he was killed in combat operations in Afghanistan. Can you tell me everything you know? Because I want to be with him every moment until he died. Mm -hmm. And he asked me every single thing, every question you can imagine a parent would want to know about their child. And we developed this, this relationship. And in the end, he uh, discussed it with his ex-wife. And they thought that the other siblings of the boy wouldn't be able to handle seeing the pictures. So they asked us not to publish. So the only picture that could be published is the one with the flag over his body. Wow, so to this day you have not published To this things. day, I recently gave a talk, um, and it was close to Florida where he lives, yeah. and I asked him if I could show the pictures on screen, mm -hmm. and he gave me permission to show the full edit. Wow, wow. But that's almost 10 years later. Right, right. So. When you were with these soldiers and you were trying to prove yourself, so part of the hurdle is physical, just sure. just showing that sure. as a woman that you can actually keep up <clears throat> and hike, Absolutely. and that you're not going to get queasy at the blood, you get queasy at the, at the at the conflict. Um, can you talk about other ways that you've had to prove yourself as a female war correspondent? So I think the, the, the thing is there are so many ways to do this job. Right. And you know sometimes I'm trying to be tough and to be able to get like sort of act like one of the guys. And sometimes I'm posing as someone's wife. So <laughs> you know, for example, when Dexter Filkins and I did the Talibanistan story for the New York Times Magazine, um, we, Dexter spent about a month trying to line up access with one of the Taliban commanders in the tribal area in Pakistan. 
And finally, he got the access, and he called me, said, OK, ready to come in. So I flew in. And we were in Peshawar in Pakistan, near the tribal area. And the night before we were supposed to leave, the commander said, OK, you are welcome to come tomorrow. But the one thing you cannot do is bring a woman. And of course, Dexter and I were like, well, we're going together. We're a team, you know? Right. And so Halim, who was our, we had two uh, local journalists uh, who were working with us. And Halim was sort of sympathetic to the Taliban. And he said, oh, I don't know what to do. No women. What do we do with Miss Lindsay? Miss Lindsay, can't you give Mr. Dexter your camera? Miss Lindsay. And I was like, no, Halim, figure it out. So he's like, okay, I know. You are Mr. Dexter's wife, and no Taliban would leave his wife alone in a strange village, so you have to come. I was like, great, I'll be his wife. I don't care. Just get me in. So we went as husband and wife, and it's so fun. I don't know who in this room knows Dexter Filkins, but he doesn't have that much tact when it comes to So we walk into this tiny room of Taliban fighters, probably like definitely not as big as the stage. And I'm like the elephant in the room because I'm, women don't leave their house in this part of the world, so I'm fully veiled. You can't see any of my skin. <laughs> I walk into this room sort of like fumbling. I have my cameras in the bag, and I sit down behind Dexter, and he's like, hey, Haji Namdar, you know, thanks for letting my wife come, and you know, my wife has a camera. Do you mind if she takes some pictures? <laughs> and I was like, there's no way. And I pull out like the most massive Nikon camera, and I was like, there's no way they're going to believe <laughs> and of course, and I'm shooting through my veil, so my eyes aren't even unveiled. I'm oh like God. shooting, and then I dropped one of my lenses, and I was like, oh, "Forget it! I'm just gonna open this little slit for my eyes, and I'm trying to shoot through." And so then, at one point, and this is, you know, this part of the world. The irony, of course, is that this part of the world is one of the most hospitable places in the world. If they invite you in, they have to give you tea and they have to serve you. And so we're sitting in this room full of Taliban fighters, and. Like 15 minutes into the interview, everyone in the room is getting really fidgety. And I was like, oh, of course, this is where they kill us. I mean, what are we thinking? Like, we're <laughs> Americans meeting with the Taliban. And so we sit there, and this guy comes over, and he says, madam, we would like to serve you tea, but we don't know how you can drink the tea through your veil. <laughs> please, madam, please, stand in the corner, lift the veil, face the wall, drink your tea, and then you can come back. And oh, I was God. like, I cannot oh, believe the Taliban is freaking out about how to give me tea. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my God, that's, fun. that's yeah. so funny. Um, in Mosul, I actually covered a story about, uh, about the dress code that women had to endure. And at first, it was, it was a, a robe all the way down to the floor. Mm. Then it was the face covering veil. Mm -hmm. uh, then it was an extra flap over the eyes so that, so that there was no eye contact at all. Then it was gloves and, um, and stockings. So you were basically women just became this black, yeah. blo black blob. And I interviewed this grandmother who had gone to a picnic with her family. And she was an older woman. Mm. She wasn't young. And her crime was that she had lifted up her veil to take a spoonful of the food that they were having at this picnic, and they caught her. I mean, basically, it was not even a nanosecond of seeing yeah. her mouth. And um, she actually un undressed in front of me and showed me the scars on her back of the, wow. of the, the lashing that she And had for your information, older women are usually exempt from a lot yeah. of the sort of uh, hijab necessities because they're not sexual anymore. So yeah. older women, technically, they, some of them show their faces, and they don't have to be yeah. as covered. Yeah. When I was in Afghanistan, I had a similar, a similar sort of bizarre experience where um, uh, I had had a female translator with me. So of course, as a woman, you have access to, as, as you have said, both of these worlds. Yeah. You can go interview the men and you can go interview the women, but no Afghan man can come into the room to interview a woman. Yeah, exactly. My female translator had stayed for part of the trip. Then her husband called her, she had to leave. Um, and I was left with only a male translator. And there was a woman that I desperately wanted to interview in, in this village. And so the way that we decided to do it is I and her were behind the door. <laughs> oh <my. laughs> we were inside the house behind the door and my Afghan translator had to stand outside yeah. and scream the questions yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> over the wall. Yeah. It was just, it was like Twilight Zone. It's you know? ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, exactly. How did you get access to get, to get in to see the Taliban? Uh, Dexter did it. So sometimes, you know, I think something that a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of this work is collaborative. So I can't do half the work I do without the journalists I work with. And sometimes photographers give ideas to the writers. And so I think it's really a collaborative process. It's really 
Um, you know, in this case, he stayed on the ground and worked all the contacts, and I came in at the last minute. Yeah. It bears noting that this is the series that you won a Pulitzer for, right? Yes, this was part of a package that the whole New York Times won. Right. You've spoken about how it's an advantage to be a woman. We know that female captives that have been held by the Taliban have been raped. Yes. Can you talk about the fear of rape as, as you go about your work and how, how that is one thing that affects you specifically as a woman? Sure, and I think we can speak to actually this is, um, uh, which is quite relevant given the Nobel Peace Prize today, but this is a series from 2008 in the Democratic Republic of Congo on rape as a weapon of war. Um, and so for at least 10 years, I've been photographing women victims of rape as a weapon of war all over DRC, um, South Sudan, uh, I've been in Uganda, I've been um, all over really interviewing women. So one thing that sort of sits in the back of my mind always as a woman is, will this happen to me? Mm -hmm. And of course in Libya, that was really exacerbated. I mean, it was the first thing that I thought about when we were taken. And you know, I thought about a lot of these women. Um, this is Ayak, she was raped in South Sudan. She's almost nine months pregnant with uh, her perpetrator's child. Um, you know, for me, it's really, these women have shared their stories with me and they also got me through one of the hardest experiences of my own life because I remember uh, there was a moment uh, when we were in prison in Libya and we were tied up and we had endured three days already of being beaten up and threatened with execution and me being touched by every man basically we came across. And I remember being in this prison cell and thinking of all the women that I had photographed over the years and how incredible they were and how resilient they mm -hmm. were mm -hmm. and how they had endured so much worse than I, ha I was enduring at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, I, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. And so they really became a source of inspiration for me. One of the stories that we collaborated on was the terrible story of what happened to Yazidi women, which I think is very relevant today given that Nadia Murad has just won the Nobel Peace Prize. Absolutely. Can you talk about, uh, you've, covered, you've covered rape in the Congo, as have mm -hmm. I, and you covered the Yazidi rape story. Mm -hmm. How do you compare the stories? How do I compare the stories? I think, look, it's hard to, it's hard to compare stories in such different parts of the world. I think that all of these experiences are experiences that are very traumatic. Uh, they're taking place in very different cultures. I think the one thing they have in common is that when there is a war, social norms break down and things are happening that generally would not happen um, and people go unpunished. And so I think what's left are these women and men also who uh, have years of trauma that they often can't express. Um, and so you then meet these incredible people like Nadia who want to share their stories and help other women in the future. As a female who is photographing the most gendered experience that there is, which is being raped, um, do you think that that gives you an edge or allows you to be closer to, to the subject? I mean, it's hard because I, I, I think in my experience, it also depends on what part of the world you're working in. I think if it's a story in the Muslim world where people are very conservative uh, and women are typically segregated from men, women feel more comfortable talking to women. Right. I think that um, you know, no one really feels comfortable talking about sexual assault, but certainly these women um, share most of their intimate experiences with other women. And so it's important to respect that culture and to go in there uh, very sensitively and to keep whatever sort of socially generally happens, yeah. keep that status quo so you don't make them more nervous than they are. So That's I think, you know, my experience uh, dealing with women in these situations is that it helps being a woman. You know, this is, this image is a woman of Mama Cisse. She is, um, this is the story that um, Merck for Mothers was sort of, they, they looked at the story and there's an accompanying video. And I've, I hung out with her for about an hour before she gave birth to the second of twins. And she started hemorrhaging and I was photographing and videotaping and I kept saying to the midwives, I think she's bleeding too much. And they were sort of just mopping up the blood and saying, no, she's fine. And finally I went 
And I actually went to find the one doctor in the whole province, and he was in surgery. And I went and I put on scrubs and I went into the surgical ward and I said, I think there's a woman dying. And he sort of looked at me and was like, well, I'm busy. And so then I went back and I encouraged the midwives, like, maybe you should take her blood pressure, maybe you should take her to the doctor. So they picked her up and carried her over to the doctor. And he came out of surgery and she died. Oh. And mm -hmm. it was, it was, to me, it was so unbelievable because she was so alive mm -hmm. and she gave birth and died, like within the span of an hour. And, um, and I was so frustrated because there was no doctor. I mean, this is, a, this is in 2010. At that point, there were three OBGYNs mm -hmm. in the entire country. And, you know, so to me, it was just criminal that as a woman, you die giving birth. And one in eight women in Sierra Leone at that time had a risk of dying in childbirth. And so, you know, that became, um, with this story and with another story I had done in Afghanistan, I really decided to try and focus on maternal death, do at least one story a year mm -hmm. where I go and focus on that. Mm -hmm. And so some of these images are also from other women who had uh, complications. She had uh, eclampsia, so she had very high blood pressure when she gave birth, and she had seizures and went into a coma, and she ended up uh, surviving. This is the sister of a woman who hemorrhaged after childbirth, and this is the moment the sister died. Okay. The sister fainted and passed out. Okay. So, yeah, for me, it's really important to focus also on some women's issues. Um, we did Finding Home for Time magazine. This is a story where we followed uh, Syrian refugee mothers through uh, the final months of their pregnancy and f through the first year of their children's lives. And you know, we see a lot of images of refugees, but it's very hard to relate to them and to sort of penetrate their lives. And so the point of the story was to get in deeper. Right. How do you metabolize the suffering that you sometimes witness? Um, you know, I try to channel everything I see into the work and to try to just get it published and to, to sort of try to change policy or affect policy or to get people motivated to do something. Um, this is a story I did with Denise Grady for the New York Times, and it was on breast cancer in Uganda. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Mary Namata. She's a woman who had been living with these tumors for almost five years, but she was too ashamed to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And so she finally, uh, she heard there were American doctors with, uh, Seattle, from Seattle who were looking at uh, cancer, people who had cancer. And so she showed up at this hospital and just took off her shirt and had these tumors. And very luckily, uh, one of the doctors did a biopsy right there and suggested she go in and have a mastectomy right away, and she lived. But it's really about information. It's about getting this out. Um, you know, I think that she was one of the lucky ones. What are some things that, that you think people do not know about the preparation that goes into covering conflict zones like you do? Sure, I think uh, access is one of the hardest things to um, explain, is how difficult it is. People, I don't know, um, when you read the newspaper or a magazine and you see an image from a place that's far away, you know, what goes into getting access to those photos? I started covering the war in Darfur uh, in 2004, and at that point, the Sudanese government did not want journalists there. So the only way in was to fly to Chad and to literally walk through rivers uh, across the desert for about a mile with everything over your head, you know, carrying my cameras and clothes and everything, we water, mm -hmm. um, until we met up with rebels and literally drove around Darfur with them on the back of a pickup truck with about 15, 16 other fighters for five days. And we, there were skeletons across the desert. There were, this was the first time a woman ever admitted to me of being raped as a weapon of war and also assaulted. Um, in 2008, I was working with Lydia Polgreen for the Times, and um, we had heard that this village had been bombed by the government, and it was very remote, and we couldn't get access to it, and the only way in was on a helicopter, and WFP, which is the World Food Program, had the only helicopters, because they had permission from the government to bring food in. And so we went to the landing zone, Lydia and I, and we said, like, can we get on the helicopter? We want to report on this story. And they said, no, no, there are eight seats and they're all for WFP staff. 
And Lydia went ballistic. And she <laughs> said, don't you know the power of an image? Don't you understand that if you let at least my photographer on this helicopter, your people will understand the conflict in Darfur? She said, I don't need to go, just put her on. And it was on the front page of the New York Times the next day. And it's like, you know, she was right. And she, you know, she was very selfless and let me take that seat because she understood that in that moment, an image would be powerful. Right. So a lot of this has to do with access. It has to do with how you get there. This is a case in 2000, and I think this was 2006, where we had heard Sudanese government soldiers had been massacred in Darfur. And President Bashir, who's the president of Sudan, uh, went on TV and he said, absolutely no government soldiers were killed. That's just a lie. And so Lydia and I were in Chad, and we went to the border, and we found a group of rebels. And we said, hey, will you take us across the border? did this really happen? And they said, yeah, there are bodies everywhere. And so we said, can you take us in? And they said, well, you know, there are Antonov aircraft flying overhead and they're bombing people if they think. And we said, well, it's the New York Times. Like, we have to see it if we're going to report on it. And they were like, okay, come. So we got in the back of the car and we drove in. <laughs> and then we got there and there were bodies clear across the desert. And it was exactly, you know, this picture is really the power of photography. It's like, you cannot deny what had happened. Um, so then it was really important to sort of see that. I was not at the times when, when you and Lydia were doing your Darfur reporting, but I remember even for me, um, as somebody who did not study this conflict, this was the reporting that put it on the map. This, this was when I became aware in my own imagination that there was a place called Darfur and that, that a genocide might be unfolding. Yeah, and I mean, that was, a, that was a case where having someone incredible like Lydia, who was smart and tenacious and brave, and you know, I, it's, I couldn't have done half that work without her. Right. You were pregnant. Uh, and, there we go. And you, <laughs> and you continued working very late into your pregnancy. Um, that caused some controversy when, when you ended up writing about it. Can you talk about that decision? Yeah, I think, you know, I have been doing this work for 23 years, and a lot of the women that I photograph are often pregnant, and they are working and living in the places I photograph, and guess what? It's not so precious. <laughs> you know, they're still chopping wood and doing their work and doing, going about their daily lives, and I think when people hear, oh, she went to Afghanistan when she was pregnant, mm -hmm. I'm not like, Fly, bullets aren't flying around me. I'm going and I'm meeting with women in their homes and interviewing them and doing portraits. Or I did this story on the drought, for example, um, in Kenya. And so, you know, really for me, it was about um, listening to my body and not sort of overworking myself. I was doing what I always did and I felt great. And so for me, I really didn't understand why suddenly. Uh, people felt entitled to make decisions for me and my body when I felt very comfortable. I didn't know you yet, um, and I remember when, when your article came out in the Times Magazine that had, that, where, where you talked about being pregnant and, sure. and, and working, and I got into a pretty vicious Facebook fight <laughs> with, with a friend of mine who, not a friend of mine, a colleague of mine who, um, who, who you know, just lay into you. Yeah. And the thing that really got me is both you and I have traveled with male colleagues mm. whose wives gave birth when they were on assignment, sure. who had very small children at home, who put themselves in enormous risk, you mm -hmm. know, in the kind of risk that could leave a child without a father. Sure. Um, and yet there's never any criticism. Never. And in fact, when, um, you know, when I've had male colleagues who have been killed or who have died while working and they have children, no one, I've never heard one person say, well, what was he doing in a war zone? Right. Whereas if that were a woman with children, you can be guaranteed that the first thing they would say is how irresponsible, what was she doing in a war zone? So I think there's still a, a pretty big double standard with this work. Right, right. You were very comfortable working as a pregnant woman and you kept on doing it very late into your pregnancy. Um, and I agree with you because I've lived in these countries and you know, in Senegal, women go, women literally give birth after they harvest, you know, they, yeah. on the side of the field. You know, yeah. they, they work up until the very, the very last moment and there's nothing, there's nothing unusual That's about life. that. That's yeah. life, However, you did hide that from all of your colleagues, including your other editors, I think until month six, 
Can you talk about that? Because I think that's a very interesting decision that you made. Yeah, I think, first of all, I come from like a big Italian family where there are no secrets. I mean, like zero secrets. And I hid it from my own parents until wow. I was like more than four months pregnant. So I didn't want anyone to know because I felt like my editors um, would start making decisions on my behalf right. um, as to what assignments they would give me, where I could go, what I can do. And I didn't want that. I wanted to uh, talk to my doctor, talk to my husband, make those decisions myself. And so I basically um, hit it until I really couldn't hide it anymore. <laughs> and I was on assignment with um, Joe Klein and we were doing a road trip across America and I was about between five and six months and I just, like, in that two weeks, my stomach just popped, and I kept having to go buy clothes, and I was like, you know, I'd shoot all day, and then I'd run to, like, Target or wherever I could and try and get bigger pants, and finally I was like, he's gonna think I'm, like, binge eating at night, like, I, I don't know what to do. So, like, I went, I finally, like, woke up one morning, and I went downstairs, and I was like, morning, Joe, and he's, like, having his omelet, and I'm like, I'm like, and he's like, morning, and I'm like, I'm almost six months pregnant, and he's like, what? <laughs> and I was like, I just didn't want you to think that, like, you know, I, I wasn't going to give you my all and that I'm not. And he was like, you are crazy. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I guess. But I think, you know, unfortunately, that's how I felt. And I, that's what I felt comfortable with. So you were afraid that, that editors might, might restrict you, might not yeah. give you the assignments that you wanted. And, and I completely relate to that. Sure. I think. And I think they might have just because out of perhaps out of fear, you know, for, <clears throat> sure. for you. Can you describe what happened to you in Gaza? Sure. Um, so I was covering a prisoner exchange and I was 27 weeks pregnant and uh, working for the Times. And it was there. It wasn't there wasn't war going on at that time in Gaza. It was literally an exchange of uh, one prisoner for I think 1,028 Palestinians. And so I, uh, any journalist going into Gaza has to stop at the Israeli press office and get credentialed and get, so I went in and I got credentialed with the Israeli press office and then I went into Gaza. And um, coming out, at, at some point I thought, okay, I should leave because now it's, it's um, almost 28 weeks and I should go. So I was on my way out and I called the press office and I said, Shlomo, it's Lindsay with the New York Times. Uh, you facilitated me getting in and I'm coming out and I understand there are many x-ray machines and very um, intense searches on the way out and could you, could you call ahead and let them know that I'm pregnant, I'm 27 weeks pregnant? And, and he said, yes, no problem. So I got there, and um, the way air is crossing, the way you get out of Gaza, it's almost like an airport. So they have, uh, everything is on the ground, and the Israeli soldiers are up above, through be, uh, behind bulletproof glass. So I came in on the ground, and you have to press a button, like an intercom, and say, so I press a button, I said, I'm with the New York Times, and Shlomo had called ahead, and you know, I prefer, if it's possible, can you do a hand search, because I'm pregnant. And, and the guy on the intercom comes back and he says, well, you can take all your clothes off and we strip search you, or the, he's like, or you can basically be here all day. And so I turned to Steve Farrell, who was living there at the time in Jerusalem, and I said, Steve, what should I do? And he said, you know, you should probably just go through the x-ray machine. It's just once and it'll be fine, but otherwise they're gonna really make, give you a hard time. And I said, okay. So I put all my bags through and I go through and it's one of those full body scanners. So I go and I'm in this thing and I do the full body scan and the, the glass goes around and the way it works is there's a red light and a green light. So once the scanner goes, there's a green light and you walk to the next compartment. So the green light, uh, the red light turned green and then I was, as I was about to walk, it turned red. And I looked up and they're all up above and they said, whoops, you moved and I said, I didn't move, and they said, you moved, do it again. So they did it, and three times they made me do the scan, oh and they were laughing. They were all just looking down, laughing at me. And so then, after three times, the light turned green, and instead of going straight, they made me go to the right, and an AP photographer had said to me, if you end up in a room with the greats, you're being strip searched. And so they pushed me to the right, and I looked down, and I'm in a room uh, with the greats, and I said, it's not possible. And it's pitch black. 
and suddenly a light flips on and there's a woman behind bulletproof glass and she says, take all your clothes off. Oh my God. And, and at this point I was fuming and I said, you're kidding. And she said, take your clothes off. And I said, sorry, did the x-ray machine not work all three times? And she said, take your clothes off. And I said, so, you know, are all the men up there watching? Like, I'm not really sure what's going on here. And so basically I was strip searched and then I was let through. And I wrote, of course, the one thing that I can think of is this, if this happens to a New York Times accredited journalist, imagine the Palestinian women, um, what happens to them. And so I wrote a letter uh, backed by the Times, you know, just a formal complaint saying this is unfair. And, and I think, according to Nick Kristof, I'm the only journalist ever to receive a public apology from the Israeli Ministry of Defense. <laughs> so that's my claim to fame. <laughs> how, how do you explain what happened? Did, did they think that you were I can't. I mean, or No, I think that, you know, in that text, they just weren't happy with journalists being in Gaza. I, I mean, I don't, I can't get into what they were thinking because, frankly, it was evil, but I, you know, that's what happened. We have a couple of Facebook Live questions that I'm, that I'm going to ask Lindsay, and then afterwards uh, we're going to have a, a Q&A with, with everybody here, two microphones, one on either side of the room, so um, we'd love to hear from you as well. Isaac from Facebook asks, can you talk about the struggle between being an observer and physically intervening in a violent situation among subjects? Um, so I think the first thing that's important to realize is that I'm not a doctor. So I often, like, I often can't help in ways that other people who are trained medical professionals can help. I mean, often as a journalist, I can't really get involved. The most that I can do is give someone a ride to the hospital, and it can't be a combatant. It can't be someone with a weapon. It can't be someone in uniform. It can't be, you know, I, it could be a child or a woman who's unarmed. And I think it's very important to not get involved in that, in that case. So I think there was um, one situation where, let's see, I'll go back, where I got involved and I decided actually to stop taking pictures because of that. And it was a woman, I was doing a story on maternal health in Afghanistan. And um, there was a woman, I had actually spent like two weeks in very remote areas of Afghanistan. And on the way back, um, I saw these two women on the side of the mountain and there was no man with them, so we thought something might be wrong. And so we stopped the car and me and Dr. Ziba, who was my translator, ran up and said, what's wrong? And she said, the woman on the right was Nornisa and her water had just broken. Mm -hmm. And her husband's first wife died in childbirth. So he managed to get a car, but the car broke down. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, just, I'll take you to the hospital. That's where we're going. And they said, well, we need permission from the husband. Oh God. And so I turned to Ziba and I said, well, look, there's one road in the whole province, so go find her husband. <laughs> and so she did. She found him and brought him back. And I took about maybe three to five frames of this entire scene, just like this. And at that point, I piled the whole family in my car and I stopped shooting. Mm -hmm. And I didn't shoot anymore because I felt like it was more important to take her to the hospital. And frankly, it didn't really matter. It wasn't, you know. Um, but I could have continued shooting, but I would have just put that in the caption that this is the only reason they made it to the I hospital see. is because I took them. But this is a case where I shot a few pictures and then when I intervened, I stopped shooting. That is, of course, the journalistic principle that once you, be, once you become involved in sure. a situation, then, then you have to take a step back. Ethan from Facebook has a, has a similar question. How do you balance journalistic integrity with getting close to your subjects? When do you decide to not take a photo? The only time I don't take a picture is when they tell me not to, because I'll basically just shoot and shoot and shoot, and I leave it up to the subject, basically, to put, to put those boundaries. Um, for me, I get very close to subjects. I, I um, open up as much as they do, and I'm very, I sort of really throw myself into every story. Um, so I really let them give me the parameters of what they feel comfortable with in terms of photographs, and, and that's up to them. Right. Gary from Facebook asks, can you talk about your point of view on how U.S. intervention has affected Afghanistan, especially the women there? No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, that's a tough question. I, you know, it's a war that's gone on way, way too long, yeah. but it's, it's hard. I've tried to cover the war from... Uh, both sides, and I see, you know, both sides, but it's hard to talk about because 
I've seen a lot of suffering. Of course. I think we'll take questions from the audience now. There are two microphones um, on either side, I believe. And we'd love to hear what you have to ask. Hi, thank you so much for that chat. Um, just to your question on you know, how a female reporter can, can interact abroad, and then also your points on access. Um, I think it's really important to highlight that local women don't have the access that you have. Yeah, absolutely. So my family's from Yemen, and mm -hmm. there's things that I can never do to this day because it puts myself and my family on the line. Absolutely. So I think it's really important to call that out uh, when you absolutely. ask questions around how you, know, how you engage as a female reporter. Right. Uh, that being said, my question to you then is, given your role and your access and your privilege, how can you support local women in Afghanistan, in Yemen, to become stronger reporters? Absolutely, that's a great question. I think, look, in an ideal world, it would be locals photographing their own stories because I think you know, they have the most intimate view of their own culture um, and they see parts of conflict that we will never access. Um, but I do think that Rukmini and I were talking about how as female journalists, we're often seen as this sort of third sex where we can enter spaces where, um, you know, as a woman, but also sort of just as a journalist, we're, we're seen as something that is very foreign, so we get access to things that typically women would not access. And so I think that's the same for locals. I think I've seen myself um, with uh, local journalists I'm working with, translators, uh, they're treated very differently from me just because I'm an outsider. And so I don't know how we break that. I don't know um, how that can change. I think it has to change from the inside. It's certainly not gonna change from the outside. I think that we can support uh, local journalists by teaching them, uh, showing them how to do the work, working alongside them so that they have the tools and they can develop um, as photographers or as journalists and understand you know, the rules of the trade. I mean, one thing that I see, I've lived all over the world, and I remember when I was living in India, um, you know, journalists just didn't have the integrity that, the, that we have in the West because they were never taught. So all the photographers were setting everything up, telling people to do things over again, moving people out of the way. <laughs> to, and I was mortified because right. here was me, you know, here I was the idiot who would actually stand somewhere for two hours waiting for something to happen. And then a local photographer would come in and be like, wait, can you just do that again? I missed that picture. And I was like, wait, you can't do that. So I think it also, you know, we have to teach people and, and to show them what's okay and what's not okay. I would add to that that there are, of course, some exceptions. Like, for instance, in Afghanistan, there's a woman called Fariba Nama, who is Afghan. She was born in Afghanistan. Um, yes, she spent uh, a portion of her life in America, so she had also an American citizenship, but she speaks completely fluent, Pashtun, etc. And when she's on the ground, she's Afghan. And I think that she is treated much like you and I are treated, and that's because she has assumed this role. You know, she is not afraid to, to, to push through these boundaries that might be more difficult if you're, if you're living full time in that country. Thank you. Hi, um, your work has been an inspiration to me. And um, my question relates to Latin America. Um, Latin America seems to be kept off the radar mm -hmm. and the level of violence and loss um, specifically related to Venezuela currently. Mm -hmm. yep. um, would you ever think about going and point, pointing your lens, um, you know, you're talking about maternal mental health, uh, not maternal mental health, maternal mortality rates mm -hmm. that are at 90% over mm -hmm. the last three years. Um, have you ever thought about um, highlighting those stories? Yeah, I, I actually started my career in Latin America, so I was very, very interested uh, in working and living in Latin America. And then September 11th happened, and that was sort of it. I mean, I, I, um, I used to go to Cuba starting in 97. I went every year. I would stay with a family and photograph you know, life in Cuba in the 90s, and then moved to Argentina to learn Spanish, and was working all over Latin America, moved to Mexico, um, in early 2001, and then September 11th happened, and I was on the first plane out of Mexico and basically never went back. I mean, so I think now 
at this point, it's a, a good time to sort of start looking back at Latin America because there are so many incredible and very important stories going on. Um, I've ironically been working a lot in America um, because I think it's a really interesting time to be working here right now. Um, there are a lot of very important stories to tell and I think that's been very interesting to me to also work here now. I would also add that Meredith Cahut, um, who is based in Venezuela, uh, also at times a uh, shooter, um, has been doing just absolutely Incredible. remarkable work, yeah. remarkable work out of Venezuela. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thanks so much. Thank you for adjusting the microphone. He noticed I was so much shorter. <laughs> um, I, my question for you is you've witnessed firsthand so much human suffering. Are you optimistic about the state of the world? And if you are, why? And how do you, how, how, and I don't mean that as in you shouldn't be, but, but why, like what do you see that gives you hope and how do you, how do you balance that with what you see? Um, you don't want to take that? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I covered the Islamic State the uh, whole time. <laughs> um, so that should leave me quite depressed, but I guess I'm just an optimist by nature. Um, the, reason, the reason I say that is when you go to these places, and, and you see such stark cruelty and also such unbelievable human goodness. Yeah. Um, in, in Mosul uh, last year, um, uh, ISIS had overrun you know, much of northern Iraq and they had taken over a village called Omar Khan. ISIS is a Sunni Muslim group and they considered Shia Muslims to be apostates as much as Christians and Jews. They were killing any Shia that they found. And in that village, there was a single mosque the mosque was run by an imam who happened to be Sunni. And he hid the Shias in his village, in his mosque. When ISIS came, he lied and he said that they were Sunnis. He taught them the Sunni rituals um, so that they would pray in the Sunni way, uh, so that they would not make utterances that were, that were non-Sunni utterances. He was taken to the Sharia tribunal by ISIS multiple times, questioned over and over again. He thought he was going to be killed. And yet he did it. Just you know, in, in the way that people saved other people in the Holocaust, right? And I really take hope from that. Yeah, I think that all, most of the people I photograph, they haven't lost hope, so how can we? I mean, they're really the ones bearing the brunt of what's happening, so. Yes, ma'am. I just want to say both of you guys are like my role models. You're incredible. <laughs> and <laughs> Thank you. so as an aspiring photojournalist and like foreign correspondent, I was wondering what piece of advice each of you had, if you had like one main piece of advice. Probably the same advice my parents gave me is don't think about money and just do what you love. <laughs> yeah. And you're going to work your ass off. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In addition to that, I would add what an editor told me early on. So I started my career at a very small newspaper in Chicago where my first assignments were literally Christmas tree lighting ceremonies. The Christmas tree lighting ceremony in Streamwood, Illinois. I did a good job. They gave me the Streamwood lighting ceremony in Hanover Park, Illinois, and then in Bartlett. And then by that point, I wanted to shoot myself. But um, uh, uh, at this newspaper, every, most people that were ambitious understood that you kind of just have to put in your time and then you move on you know, to bigger things. And there was a divide in the newsroom between reporters who went as quickly as they could through these various assignments to try to get to kind of the big story, the one where they were going to shine. And my editor sat me down and said, every single assignment that comes across your desk, do your very best. Because in doing that, you are going to learn the skills that will serve you much later. And that was so true. Um, I, I dove into Christmas tree lighting ceremonies in the way <laughs> that I dove into reporting on Mosul. I did some too. Yeah. Um, and because, because you hone your craft, at the beginning of your career, you're going to do a lot of really boring things, a lot of really tedious things. Do them to the best of your ability, because in doing that, you'll become better. Thank yeah. you. Hi. So my question is, do you find the, the transition from your experiences or life in a conflict zone to life back in New York or wherever that may be challenging, and, and how do you cope with that, if so? Um, I think I've been doing it for many years now, so I've learned sort of techniques to be able to go between the two worlds, um, and it's really important to do that because I think 
it's not fair to my husband and my son and people in my life if I come back from an assignment and I need two days or three days to sort of figure out where I am. And because I often don't have that time, I don't have the luxury of that. I have to literally land and pick up my son from school and do his homework and do, you know take him to the park. I mean, I think that it's important for me personally to be very present um, no matter where I am. I think, um, Probably the, the one assignment that I had a very hard time transitioning out of was the Korangal Valley. Mm -hmm. And that was because we were literally living on the side of a mountain in a bunker for two months. And it was very intense. And the final sort of uh, week long and like operation uh, was terrifying and, and really difficult. And, and um, so I had a hard time. When I got home, I just couldn't. I couldn't process what I'd been through, and this was 2007, and I remember I kept breaking down and crying in the middle of conversations, and my husband would introduce me, this was when I was first started dating my boyfriend, my husband who was then my boyfriend, and he'd introduce me to people, and I'd have to excuse myself and go to the bathroom and cry, and it was really overwhelming because I had never been through that, and it was PTSD, but it was something that I didn't really know how to handle. Um, but that was, eventually it went away. I mean, it took you know, a good two, three months to work through that. But that was really the one time where I had a very hard time processing what I had been through. I would say for myself, my, my rock is my husband. Um, and he's, he's, he's the person I call in the morning when I get up. Uh, and I call him when I'm stuck at a checkpoint. And I call him at night before I go to sleep. So that, that creates this kind of connective tissue where my life at home and my life you know, in the field are, are always connected. Back to advice, um, the young woman who asked before, I would say one other piece of advice, and I think Lindsay and I have both gotten lucky in this category, especially as a woman, the partner that you choose is really going to make a very, very crucial difference in whether you're able to do your, your career properly. I know so many women um, in this field that have ended up curtailing their own ambitions because they had partners that were less than supportive. Hi, you both seem just incredibly brave, just so brave, and you guys have done things that I just can't imagine how you would have been prepared for it, how you would have been trained for it, how you would have like done it, and you must have been terrified, so I wonder if you could, and we've talked about this a little bit tonight, but could you speak to personal bravery and cultivating that, and how you've done that, and whether you're still scared? I mean... I don't think either of us think of us. Uh, no, as I, do, I don't brave. think of myself as brave you at all. You just seem it so much. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, it's like the last thing I would say about myself. But I think, you know, like I said before, the first time that I had a near-death experience, I couldn't stop crying, and I like hid behind a school, so I didn't feel very brave. Right. And then I realized I couldn't get out of the country, so I had to just sort of buckle up and keep working. And then I think the first time I was in an ambush, I was, um, I had been kidnapped in Iraq and then we made a decision not to leave the country because I wanted to sort of work through that fear and I didn't think that if I wanted to be a conflict photographer that the best um, technique would be to get on the first plane and leave so we decided to stay but then the next day like 30 people got kidnapped and so I thought okay this would be horrible if we got re-kidnapped and so we went and embedded with the military <laughs> And the military, uh, we went to a base near Fallujah, which was close to where we got taken. And we were waiting for a few days for them to give us our first sort of operation. And they tried to send us into the village we had just been kidnapped in. And the writer I was with was like, yeah, let's go. And I was like, are you crazy? Because we just lived because we convinced them we were journalists. Now you want to show up at the US military? <laughs> and right. so obviously, like any other journalist is going to get killed. So right. we didn't do that, but we ended up going somewhere close by. And they put us in the back of a seven ton pickup truck, a seven ton military truck, which is open back and not armored. At two in the morning, we, there were 17 Marines in the back of this truck and us, and I had never been in an ambush before, and I had just been kidnapped, and I was like, I remember saying to the reporter, like, I hate your guts, it was the middle of the night, and we roll into this village and watch the insurgents mount an ambush against us, and the commander, and I don't know if he did this because the New York Times was in the truck, kept saying, you can't fire upon until you've been fired upon first. And we were like, can you just fire on them, please? And so we're literally like waiting to be ambushed. And lo and behold, a rocket goes like two feet above our heads. And I freeze. I'm like paralyzed with fear. And all the Marines in the truck 
half the truck jumped out the backside as instructed, <laughs> as I was supposed to do, but I was too scared to move. And the other half were shooting back, and I'm lying in the back of this truck, and these hot bullet casings are just landing on my face. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I have to get out of this truck because what if they hit the truck with a rocket, but I don't want to move and I can't move my legs. And I'm, so I literally picked up my own leg and was like, move. And I'm like talking to myself out loud. And then I jump on the back side of the truck. I'm five feet tall. Those trucks are like 13 feet high. I have a flak jacket helmet, all my cameras. I'm dangling off the back side of the truck and there is like full combat. I still haven't taken one picture, by the way. <laughs> so it's like, no, I wasn't a very good war photographer and I was terrified. <laughs> so like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Ladies, thank you so much for your professionalism. Um, Lindsay, my name is Patty. We have a mutual friend who's a Marine and a rescue firefighter at the oh, FDNY, okay. where I work. Bresler. Yeah. Yes. And so um, he and I often talk about leadership. And you just talked about, you know, in times of great need, you see the best and sometimes the worst in people. What are some qualities of leaders that you've seen in, in your experience? Um, I think that they stay calm and they look out for the people around them um, and they're really generous and I think Jason is a great example of that. Um, the person that she's talking about is a Marine and I was embedded with him, uh, I think I did two or three embeds with him in southern Afghanistan. And um, he, you know, I think it's really important to just keep it together and to look out for the people around you and that was really something that you see in these in in these fights and in these patrols and in when things go wrong, um, you see what how people conduct themselves. Mm -hmm. So I would add um, leaders that respect their local partners uh, and listen to them because of course they know yeah. so much more about that terrain than 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 we do. Absolutely. Uh, and that don't that don't take unnecessary risks. Mm. Um, I. Earlier this year, I had to cover uh, the Niger ambush that took four soldiers uh, in Niger last year. And uh, we were able to get access to people who had seen the investigation. And it turned out that they had been in that village um, without any of the normal preparation that, that you take to go in, in that sort of area. And having lived in Africa myself for seven years, I know how easy it is to underestimate that terrain. It looks safe until it's not. Um, and they made the mistake of thinking they had it handled and four people were killed. I think we could take one more question. Yes. Is that right? Thank you so much. Um, I'm curious about your research process and how you mm -hmm. go in with enough of an opinion to know what you're looking at and what questions to ask, but also maintain an open mind to see what you might not have expected. Sure. Yeah, I think it's really important to let the story take you rather than go into a place and say, this is the story I'm going to tell before you've ever even been there. Um, and I think, you know, there's a huge amount of research that goes into every single one of these stories, even as a photographer. I think taking pictures is like 10% of what I do. Um, there's research, there's making contacts, talking to local journalists, figuring out how to dress. I put, I included some pictures of me on assignment so you could see this is Fallujah, this is us crossing into Darfur, <laughs> this is the Korangal Valley, I'm the little one on the left, <laughs> you know, this is Afghanistan, this is South Sudan, you know, this is Somalia, so it's like, you know, I'm constantly, this is seven months pregnant in Gaza, you know, I think there's a lot of sort of doing your homework, figuring out how to, how to act, what's culturally okay, and yeah. I would add that I've worked with all sorts of photographers, and there's, there's a division between those who expect the reporter to do everything, and they're just there to shoot, right? <laughs> there are, I won't name them, right? And then there are photographers like Lindsay who are true partners. They, they, are, they are a journalist too. They are there at reporting the story as you're reporting it. And that to me has always been the most yeah. fruitful relationship because then you have two people that are digging into, into the story. So that's it, I think. Yeah, thanks you guys.